Welcome back, everyone, to another reaction video as we pick up the story where we left off from Jack Rackham, uh, the story of the, the way in which uh, many outside nations intervened in uh, the story of Iran in the 20th century. Uh, and thank you all uh, for those of you who answered my question that I threw out in the first episode, which was, how long has it been called I Iran, I guess is how it's pronounced. And uh, I I've been told by many of you that that's how it's always been called for the people who live there and that the, the name Persia, which was used up until the 1930s, was actually an exonym that was used by other nations, but never really used by the people there. Uh, so very interesting to hear all of that, and I appreciate that feedback, and we're going to continue on now. If you did not see yesterday's episode, uh, which kind of p takes the story to this point, there's a link in the description to my reaction as well as the link to the original content without my commentary if you want to check that out. Let's go ahead and dive in. In 1975, the economy of the richest country on earth was broken. Unemployment in America was worse in 1975 than in 2020. And at the same time, inflation was also out of control. And so let's talk a little bit about what's been happening, right? So you had the Great Depression in the 1930s. Uh, the U.S. starts to come out of the Great Depression right as World War II begins, which really kickstarts the U.S. economy. You have the baby boom after that. You have a lot of people that are starting to buy houses and get college educations with like the, uh, the guys on the GI Bill. You've got 16 million veterans, 16 million veterans after the war. Uh, so you've got all of that happening. And so the 1950s, the U.S. builds the Internet, the Internet, the interstate highway system, which starts to really fuel uh, travel, but also the migration to the South and the West that we continue to see today. Uh, then in the 60s, of course, you have Vietnam, you have assassinations, you have uh, unrest, you have the civil rights movement kind of coming to a head, all of this stuff. Uh, and then in the 1970s, you kind of see that 20 plus years or so of kind of boom, 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 crash. Uh, and a big part of that's going to be oil. According to rudimentary economics, that's not supposed to happen. The vice president gave a speech that year saying one person ought to teach the U.S. government how to run a country. And that was the Shah of Iran. Iran was a radically different place in the 70s. Let's this just Middle Eastern monarch for a second remember what happened to that vice president. He ends up resigning. He was secular. It was urban. Women went to universities yeah. sporting short skirts and big hair. Some Look at that. Think about that compared to what we know today about Iran and the kind of uh, culture that they have because of decades now of very strict religious rule. Look at how different that place was. Think about the trajectory that nation could have been on if things had gone differently. Some of its social welfare policies were more progressive than Sweden. Sweden! And it was getting rich. The middle class was booming. The Shah was handing out loans to Britain and the United States. The country's GDP per capita was only about seven years behind contemporaries like Germany or Japan. And that gap was closing in fast. That lasted until 1978. And in 1979, Iran was a dystopian police state at the mercy of a supreme leader whose primary export is human rights violation. And what happened in the meantime? I was born. Nah, that's not really what happened, but I was born in 1977. Revolutions are always complicated, but this one is weird. Mohammad Reza Shah is the name of our star tonight. When he came to power in 1941, he realized it's not easy being the Shah. First of all, he had to keep the British happy. The British were the ones who put his dad in charge, and when they weren't happy with the way he was running things, they invaded and sent him far away to a tiny island in the Pacific Ocean. And of course, when the British invaded, it was during the middle of World War II, so they invited their friends the Soviets, and the Soviets never pick up after themselves. They left behind all these separatist republics and communist parties that now the Shah has to clean up. And as soon as that's over with, some schmuck in parliament starts saying things like, maybe Iran shouldn't be ruled by an authoritarian monarchy. And so imagine the complicated nature of leading Iran at this time, right? 
you've got to not only try and deal with factions within your own country, just like any country has to deal with, but you've got the added pressure of having to deal with these competing factions and nations from outside your country and the influence that they're exerting and the threat that if you don't keep them happy, they'll come in and overthrow you. So you've got to deal with people in your country who want uh, to take over, who want someone different in control. You've got to people deal with people outside the country. It's a nearly impossible ask for anybody. Maybe the Shah should go into exile, but foreign spies and the Iranian military cooked up a surprise birthday present for the Shah. Okay, take a look. My old palace! Just like you left it. We knew it meant a lot to you, so we overthrew the government. But why? Oh, the Prime Minister wanted to mess with Britain's oil refineries, so we told everyone he was a dirty commie and the rest took care of itself. This is the sweetest thing anyone's ever done for me. Weird thing is, the Shah turned out to be a competent and strangely progressive leader. Just managing to survive the 1950s and navigate the complicated web of relationships with the United States, the USSR, Great Britain, the military strongman who put him in power, Iranian communists, Islamists, the middle class, parliament, and the military, that- Look at that, that's what we're talking about. Anybody who was even able to appear the least bit competent while dealing with all of that had to be doing something right. It was no small miracle. He even managed to tap into some of the country's oil money that was being controlled by foreign companies. The crown jewel of his reign was a policy known as the White Revolution. The Shah promised his people they would soon have the same standard of living as the West. Mm. He expanded voting rights for women. He built schools and roads. He redistributed land to the poor and what would not only Iran look like today, but what would the Middle East in general look like today with a powerful, democratic, progressive Iran there? I mean, one of the most populous countries in that region. I mean, think about how differently things could have gone. Acquired factories to give 20% of their profits directly to their workers. Wow. All the while, the country kept getting richer and richer. The growing middle class liked this state of affairs quite a lot, but the holy priest Ayatollah Khomeini did not. His hopes for the country he held close to his chest, but one thing he shared, the Shah didn't know best. This country's off track. If I don't act soon, there'll be no more place for traditional values. I feel like his arm's in a really weird place. Track. If I don't act soon, there'll be no more place for traditional values. Then he steepled his fingers and tightened his shoes. I'll see this Shah finished if it's the last thing I do. There were, as a matter of fact, a lot of reasons to hate the Shah. Even more than the ones Khomeini said out loud. The Shah was highly corrupt. One time he awarded a government contract to the first sales agent who let him sleep with his wife. His attempts to make Iran culturally European were not appreciated. His father had gone so far as to outlaw the hijab, which for some women was humiliating. A loose comparison I've heard is how American women might feel if they were forced to go topless. He persecuted members mm. of- And you know, that's interesting because I was talking to somebody recently about this and they were saying that they were in, um, in London, in a part of London that was heavily Jewish, and uh, their daughter was wearing shorts. And they weren't like skimpy or anything that we would consider to be kind of revealing here in America. But uh, there were women who were actually averting their eyes when they walked past her because to them that was a level of being inappropriate. And so, yeah, I can see this. Okay, you know, I mean, I've been singing the praises of the Shah here, but, uh, you know, it's tough. It's a tough balancing act, right? To know how far you can go, but not go too far. And this is why people like, and I'm jumping way back in history now to someone like Abraham Lincoln. A lot of people criticize Abraham Lincoln for not being uh, abolitionist enough, to, for not being progressive enough, for not pushing hard enough, and for taking the South back, uh, you know, and kind of being uh, very forgiving. But what Lincoln did well is he was a good he was quite a pragmatist. He he wanted to move things forward, but he knew the pace at which to do that. And a lot of people don't. A lot of people go too far, and that's where they go they make their mistake. And it seems like maybe that's what's happening here with the Shah. 
of the Baha'i faith whose whole thing is that they love and support all religions. And, lest we forget, the Shah conspired with foreign governments to overthrow Iran's democratically elected prime minister. And yet somehow, the Shah seemed to learn absolutely nothing from that experience. The schmuck was overthrown after the people began to see him as a tyrannical radical who used violence against his opponents and hated Islam. Then the Shah decides to create secret police, publicly shoot protesters, implement a one-party state, and create a new calendar based on Cyrus the Great instead of Muhammad. So Khomeini's followers- So what I just said a minute ago about going too far? Yeah, you're there, buddy are outside the royal palace chanting death to the Shah. As far as I can tell, Khomeini at this point was only a rabble rouser using harsh rhetoric. But violence seemed to lurk in his shadow. The prime minister slapped him once and was assassinated two months later. Khomeini eventually got in trouble with the law. The Shah was partial to killing Khomeini, but the head of the secret police talked him out of it, and eventually Khomeini was exiled instead. But now consider. Everyone inside of Iran who hated the Shah had to watch their backs for secret police whenever they wanted to say something, but Khomeini could smuggle cassette tapes into the country and say whatever the heck he wanted. So this is a great example of the concept of, uh, and it's a, it's a little bit crude, but it's better to have someone in the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in, so to speak. In other words, when you send somebody out and you exile them or you keep them outside the government or you keep them outside of where you can keep an eye on them, they're much more likely to cause you damage. And this is why, again, using the example of Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln puts all of his biggest rivals for the Republican nomination in his cabinet. Number one, because he recognized that they were uh, influential and they were powerful and they were men of great intelligence and ability, which is what got them to that place in the first place, but he also knew the importance of keeping them right where he could see them. And, and so that's the mistake you have here of exiling someone who is then able to kind of come back and do what they want. So who is every unhappy Iranian going to be listening to? Khomeini! This does not bode well for the Shah when Khomeini's son dies under mysterious circumstances. Khomeini blames the secret police. Every 40 days, Khomeini organizes protests around the country. Every I'm curious to know if we've ever determined what happened with that son. So it appears that the mysterious circumstances are he is said to have had a heart attack in October of 1977 but he was in the custody of the Iranian secret police at the time, which is what leads to the mysterious circumstances. Why did he just happen to have a heart attack at that time? Is it possible that it was nothing? Yeah, but under the circumstances, it does look really fishy. Protests around the country. Every 40 days, the police don't know what to do, and every 40 days, they call in the army. Every 40 days, the army opens fire, and every 40 days, Khomeini's protests get bigger. The Shah was actually busy dying of cancer, so he took the unconventional approach of giving the protesters what they wanted. He started replacing hardline officials with moderates, he relaxed censorship, he promised to reduce corruption, he Good. even appointed a new prime minister. Okay, when the people protest, concede to their demands before they even make them. Atta boy! The Shah undid the imperial calendar, undid the one-party system, closed down casinos and nightclubs, even- So, to, you know, you can look at this a couple of ways. One, you can say, well, good for him, he's hearing the people and he's responding. It's also possible this is just really about saving his own skin and only giving in. But either way, the fact that he's giving in, he's not cracking down, he's not, you know, going after these people and make things even worse. He's actually at least trying to do something. So, uh, I guess, I mean, we kind of know where this goes, but... ...even shrank the secret police. This has got to be the most effective protest in the history of authoritarian regimes. But the protests didn't stop. The flames of revolution were stoked again by the largest terror attack in history before 9-11. Mm. A whole movie theater was locked from the outside and burned to the ground. There's no clear proof who did it. It certainly ended up being a big boost for Khomeini. But if the Shah has secret police who operate outside the law to kill his political opponents, even a small amount of secret police who operate outside the law to kill his political opponents, 
if one of his political opponents may have been in the theater, people are going to blame the secret police who kill political opponents. Yeah, and this is the problem when you operate outside the law, right? Is that uh, eventually, I mean, you're dealing with, by nature, people who don't typically obey authority. So then what's to stop them from obeying your authority, even though you're controlling them? So it's quite possible that one of these people did this acting on their own. They weren't necessarily ordered to do it. And if you are somebody who makes a habit of getting ready for your political opponents, what's a bunch of uh, innocent bystanders if it helps cover up your crime of getting rid of your political opponents? So who knows? But it, it it's less about what actually happened and more about how it can be spun, how it's going to per be perceived to have happened. Nonetheless, the Shah continued his policy of kill them with kindness when you're not killing them with fire or bullets. In order to curb the growing violence, I am temporarily implementing martial law. Please return to your homes after dark and know that I am committed to expanding your civil liberties as soon as the crisis has passed. Boo! He's out after dark! So who else did temporary things like this? Well, obviously, the prime example would be Germany in the 1930s when they have to use emergency powers in order to deal with people from within who are causing problems, only they never give those powers back, and often they don't in those situations. A whole crowd of people who may or may not have even heard about the curfew got shot by the military. Yeah. And more and more citizens find themselves flocking control. to Khomeini. The Shah opens negotiations with the protesters, but... So, again, kind of keeping with the theme of what if. What if he never gets to this place? What if he keeps doing his reforms but never cracks down? Does he get overthrown anyway? Or does he maybe hang on and maybe he's able to pass power peacefully? Just when he does, oil refineries around the country go on strike and shut down the economy. Okay, I understand you're mad, but I support your right to organize negotiations. I'm going to continue paying your wages. And if any of you are living in public housing, I will not evict you. This is around the point where the U.S. might have stepped in and done something to keep the Shah in charge, but... The Shah jacked up oil prices on them a few years ago. No, this And this is, remember I said at the beginning, we're talking about there's this real oil crisis in the United States with, uh, you know, because of all of this, this does have a real world effect on the Western powers. And so, um, you know, this is one of the things that probably brings down Jimmy Carter's administration and opens the door for Ronald Reagan in 1980. This is good. This is good. We get brownie points for promoting democracy. You'll be the Prime Minister, and uh, you're gonna be like, a uh, Persian Gandhi, right? Yes. Gandhi. Meanwhile, yeah. in the strangest end to a revolution I can recall, the Shah continued to make concessions <laughs> until eventually, he just conceded the monarchy. He appointed a Prime Minister from the opposition party, hopped on a plane, and was never seen again. But the violence had only just begun. Ayatollah Khomeini, we are all so happy to welcome you back to your home. What are you feeling right now? Nothing. <laughs> well, the new government, we're working on creating a, a Muslim Vatican in the holy city of Qom with you as our spiritual leader. I am going to kick your teeth in. I appoint the government. I appoint the government in this nation. War breaks out between Khomeini and the Prime Minister, but it doesn't last long. Khomeini's been the voice of this revolution the whole time. He's way too popular. Military bases and weapons factories across the country are seized either from the outside or from the inside by his followers, and the Prime Minister surrenders. Khomeini! Khomeini, it's me! I, I, I'm, I'm the one who talked to the Shah! I saved your life! You shouldn't have. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all. The Shah has fled to the West, where his true loyalties lie. And here, now, we have created God's government. There's a I want to thank the again. faithful who these many years have fought for justice. Without you, we could not have issued summary executions. I want to thank the liberals. Without you, we could not have done away with democratic rule. I want to thank the many women who have participated in this movement. 
Without you... I love you, Ayatollah! Without you, we could not have whipped her for showing her hair in public. And now, we can all live happily ever after. So yeah, um, that's an interesting way to wrap that up. And uh, hopefully these two videos have given a little bit more context. Obviously, there, there's, there's a bit of a... A, a particular viewpoint on this and some of you have been commenting on how you maybe see things a little differently but again i would love to hear from folks who are iranian uh what your perspective is in particular uh because it you know you have a unique perspective on this that most of us will not have so i would love to hear more about that i would love to hear what things are like on the ground because you know we hear things in the news here and there and it sounds like there's a lot of kind of a, an underground movement among young people, especially to try and kind of want to push back toward democracy, whether or not that'll happen, uh, we'll see, but it'll be interesting to note. So let me know your thoughts, use the comment section below, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.